So welcome everyone for the uh, th Thursday, June 22nd, uh, 2023 meetup of the uh, Power BI and Modern Excel user group. Uh, depending on where in the world you are, it could actually also be Friday, June 23rd, I hear. Um, rumors of that kind of effect. Uh, our uh, guest speaker today is coming to us from the future. Um, so uh, let's go and, and roll off our, uh, our quick little intro of what we're going to be looking at today. Um, we've done our uh, sort of um, opening of meeting. We're now into the welcome and overview, and that's my bit. So the first thing I want to just mention is a uh, big thanks to the sponsors. As always, the uh, Vancouver Power BI and Modern Excel user group is hosted by Skillwave. Um, not that there's any kind of tie-in to what we got going on here tonight, but uh, you know, for those of you who don't know, Skillwave is Matt and I's training company that we run where we teach you how to do amazing things with Excel and Power BI. Um, Excel Guru is uh, the official parent company of Skillwave and Monkey Tools is my add-in which helps you work with Excel and Power BI models. Uh, our next meetups that we have coming up in a couple of weeks, we've got Alex Kolokolov that's gonna be coming and talking to us about how to design a dashboard to survive a corporate world. Um, so Alex is gonna be a first time speaker on our platform, which is great. And then uh, in and a little later in July, I guess, uh, Parv Chan is gonna be coming back and we're gonna be talking about uh, the next generation of ETL, Dataflow Gen 2 in Microsoft Fabric. Which for those of you who aren't familiar with the term Microsoft Fabric, uh, it is a basically sort of the, I guess the next iteration of Power BI, Matt, I, I, is a, a lot of terminology kind of flying around here. Mm. It's more enterprise level, I guess, uh, extension of, of what Power BI does. So, um, but you'll start seeing that term sort of floating around a little bit. Uh, for reference, uh, I have no intention of changing my name for the Power BI user group because this is what our audience is, is generally working with. Um, just to uh, to let people know, July 12th, we're going to be kicking off a new semester of My Excel Fundamentals Bootcamp. If you have people in your organization or yourself feels that you need to skill up on the basics of Excel, getting ready for advanced analytics, this is a fantastic program to uh, to check out. Uh, I'll just leave that there. You can always download the slides from the uh, Meetup site. And uh, as I say, it's ideal for people who need to learn pivot tables and data visualization, increase your formula reporting skills. Uh, we also have same day another semester of the self service BI bootcamp that will be opening up if you already know your basic pivot tables and formulas and you really want to learn how to work with Power Query and Power Pivot and DAX formulas and Power BI this is a fantastic program here uh, comes with coaching on a uh, um, two meetings a month and uh, it also although it doesn't say it on this, is uh, now includes a Monkey Tools uh, Pro license as well. Um, that's a brand new thing, so it's a great, uh, great program to check out as well. Um, as always, the home for our VanPug Meetup recordings is the SkillWave YouTube channel. Uh, Melinda, thank you for saying that the SSBI Bootcamp is worth every penny. I very much appreciate that. Um, yeah, so every one of these meetings is recorded, and it's posted to the SkillWave YouTube channel. Um, there's the short link here for, to get to that. Again, this is included in the slide deck. It does usually take me 24 to 48 hours to download it, produce it, and get it uploaded. But once we have done so, we will post in the Meetup site to let you know that it is live. Uh, if you're looking for some bite-sized videos, don't forget to check out Monkey Shorts. Uh, the featured episode for right now is Excel's let function is pretty much the same thing as Dax's var function with some examples of how to work with, uh, with that and a couple of other cool little tips here as well. Finally, the last thing I want to throw out there is if you would like to get involved and come and speak at Vanpug, we would love to have you. We're always interested in getting new speakers on the stage that want to talk about uh, Excel or Power BI or anything in the Power Platform and how you use these things. Uh, if you've done some cool things, we'd love to hear about it, um, you know, share it with people and inspire them. Uh, if you're interested, you can just fill out this little survey here and uh, we will get in touch and get you started. And that is the end of my deck. And uh, right now, I am not seeing that we have Joseph with us here. So I think, Matt, what we're going to do is we're going to say, check the Power BI site for any news on what's new. And we'll turn it over to you for the feature presentation. How about that? Sounds good. All thanks, right. Uh, thanks very much, Ken. So um, the famous uh, first question, can you see my screen? Can I can you, see your screen, can absolutely. <laughs> there we go. Um, the, these are 2020 questions. Can anybody <laughs> hear me? Can you see my screen? Exactly. All right. Well, um, thanks, Ken, for the opportunity to come along and, and talk about some versus some X. Um, when I was thinking about the topic, I I haven't actually ever spent time 
talking about some versus some X in any detail in one of these meetup groups before. And so I thought it would just be a great topic. My objective is to just take time and and build on the foundation and and try and bring everyone up to a common understanding of the difference between these two functions. And hopefully you'll walk away with um, a solid understanding of, of what these things are all about. So just briefly on myself, as Ken mentioned, Ken and I are partners in skillwave.training, which was a great opportunity for us to bring our similar strengths, but also our contrasting strengths together to make something that was bigger than what we were doing individually. And I'm, uh, I'm proud to be part of that and to be working with Ken. My background, I work at Coca-Cola for 25 years. I learned business and commerce through the Coca-Cola business. And I also uh, got a chance to express myself through data and typically Excel back in those days. I've been doing this um, consultancy work that I do now for nine years. I'm into my 10th year now, unbelievably. And so I do self-service consulting and training and I do a few blogs. I've been a little bit slack in the blog department lately, but we'll, we'll see, maybe I'll get back onto that horse. And, and this is my book, Supercharged Power BI, and I do go through some versus some X in, in some depth in that book. So, sorry, just as a re recap, so the objective of this session, I just want to take the time needed to explore and understand um, the nature of some and some X functions and, and give you, hopefully, a deeper understanding of what these are all about, some examples of when you should use them and um, any flaws that you might come across, things to watch out for. And it's pretty heavy on demos. I, that's pretty much it for my slides, to be honest. I've got two summary slides, which I'll uh, show right at the end. But the rest of this session, I'm planning on doing some demos. I've got a, um, I've got a couple of sample files here that I'm going to use. And um, so what I think I'll do, I, so I've got three different sample files. As I jump between the different sample files, I might just sort of pause to take questions. So please add your questions in the chat. I love questions. Uh, for, the, for the main part of the session, let's stick to some versus some X questions. But at the end, I'm happy to take any questions on, on topic or any other top question that anyone would like to ask. So I'm happy to do that. Uh, Ken, I'm not really sure how much time we've got. I've sort of I've budgeted about 45 minutes, but admittedly, I haven't done a timed run through. I'm not really sure whether I'll be finished uh, early or not, but I'm guessing it's probably going to be about 45 minutes. So yeah, you've got as much, that... time, as much time as you need, Matt, so it's uh, it's whatever uh, whatever okay. you prefer. All right. So, so as I said, my objective is to take the time and bring everyone along. And, yeah, so, so with that, let me get into it. So I'm going to start off with what I'm now calling um, – uh, a version two of AdventureWorks. Now, what I've done here is I've taken the standard AdventureWorks. Hopefully, everyone's familiar with AdventureWorks. But um, long story short, this is a this is a chain of bicycle stores. You walk into the bicycle store, you can walk around the shop, you can grab a bike, a helmet, a water bottle. You grab those three items, you go to the counter, and you scan your loyalty card. And they ring, they ring up. Is that the word anymore? They register your sales using the scanner. Beep, beep, beep. Three items were sold. Those items get stored in the sales table. This is the transactional information and the details about what the item was, who the customer was, what is the day of the transaction, what store are we in, are all permanently recorded as part of this database. So that's the concept of AdventureWorks. What's different about my version of AdventureWorks for this demonstration is that I have come into this order quantity column and literally randomized the number of items that were sold. So on the 1st of July, 2018, product 380, this single line transaction was for five items at 2443. Okay, that might be a little bit over the top. That's a lot of bikes, but... Um, that I, I've done this deliberately because I want to be able to create this, make this data a little bit more meaningful for a sum versus sum X conversation. Um, so fun fact that you may or may not know is that in the standard AdventureWorks 
database, the order quantity is always one. So nobody ever bought two bike tubes in the AdventureWorks database. And so I've just used Excel to randomize a number here just to make it a little bit more interesting. All right, so here I am. I've got a matrix. Whenever I'm doing any DAX calculations or any exploration of my data, after loading the data, after creating my relationships, I always create a matrix so that I can visualize the data. The reason I like a matrix the most is that it's very similar to a pivot table and it gives you immediate feedback as to what's going on in your underlying data. And so in this case, I've taken a column from the product table, and this is the subcategory. So there's about 30 odd subcategories in this product table. And I've written my first measure here, which is total sales. So you can see the formula here. Total sales is simply the sum of the extended amount columns. So extended amount is a physical column stored in the sales table. And I'm just simply adding up all those numbers in the table. Now, if I was just to drag that onto the canvas and what would happen is I would get a card. And you can think of a card in Power BI as it's like a single cell in Excel. Right, so it's a place where you can put one formula and get one answer. In this case, the total sales value is 88 million rounded off to the nearest million. So if I drag that measure in, that's the answer that I get. But of course, the benefit of Power BI and the way the modeling engine works is that when I drag that same formula, some of the extended amount, and I put it into a matrix, even though I've only written a single formula here, I'm actually getting multiple results. So I'm getting one result for every subcategory that exists inside my product table. Now, in some ways, this is a bit like a, a sum if or a sum ifs uh, formula in Excel. But when you're moving to Power Pivot for Excel or you're using Power BI and the, and the DAX language, I really encourage you to think about this matrix as providing a filter to your data model. So the reason, this is the way I want you to think about it. The reason we're getting 43 million for road bikes and not 88 million is because the visual, in this case, it's a matrix. The visual is putting a filter on product subcategory is equal to road bikes. So if I could just step that even one step further, if I brought subcategory, uh, it's obviously not subcategory. If I bring subcategory over here, turn this into a slicer and come down and find road bikes, click on the slicer for road bikes, notice that the card now gives me 44 million. Now, everyone understands why this works. It's because the slicer is putting a filter on product subcategory as road bikes and therefore the card updates. So the first lesson, the first thing I want you to walk away from is that this matrix is doing exactly the same thing. It's just being visualized in a different way. So the rows on the matrix is putting a filter on product subcategories equal to road bikes. And that's why we get 43.8 million, which rounds off to 44 million. Okay, now, <clears throat> of course, the, the crux of what I'm talking about here is this measure sum of the extended amount. So this is, in a way, it's a pretty dumb formula. It just says, take all the numbers in this column and add them up. But of course, through the power of filtering, we're able to get different totals depending on what filters are applied. So that's step one using just a raw sum function. And Microsoft, in fact, developed many functions in the DAX language to make it easy or easier for Excel people to migrate their Excel skills from Excel to Power BI. And so uh, that's actually why the sum function exists in the way it does. Okay, but if I come back to the data model, so over here we've got the extended amount column and notice that I've also got extended tax. So this extended amount is the amount of the total transaction without any tax added. But now I've also got a extended tax column because 
at the point of sale, the customer has to pay tax as well. And so I've got this extended tax and I've got a measure, not surprisingly, it's just summing the extended tax column and I can bring that measure into my visual and it just works exactly the same way. It'll just add up the totals. At the total level, we get the correct answers for all product sales and we can pick any single row in my visual. In this case, it's filtered by product subcategory and it's going to give us the correct answer. So, but the big problem I've got now with my model is that what if I want to know total sales, including tax? Um, I've been able to um, write these two measures, but in fact, I could come into the sales table and I could just drag the extended amount column in, I could drag the extended tax column in, and you'll note that I get the same answer. There's no, there's no formatting here but you'll note that these um, just dragging in the columns give me exactly the same answer as the measures. And it therefore follows that when I drag these columns in, these are called implicit measures. So it's implicit in that I didn't explicitly tell Power BI how to do the calculation. It was implied by the fact that I dragged that column in and Power BI made a decision the default behavior was to take all of the numbers in that column of data and add them up on my behalf. And this is why we call these implicit calculations. And so when I drag them in implicitly, Power BI adds them up and it gives exactly the same formula as the explicit version that I wrote. And so therefore it follows that the logic under the drag and drop a column is behaving in exactly the same way as this formula that I've written up here. So these are called uh, implicit measures. But what if I want to do the total sales, including tax? Just dragging these columns in doesn't work because you can only use implicit calculations by dragging a column. You can't drag two columns and force them to add up. And of course, this is where many people early on in their career, hopefully the audience at this session are past this point, but where many people would come in and create a new column. So, um, so the default behavior is to come in here, I'll add a new column. This is sort of the Excel way, isn't it? We, we, we want to take the raw data, we write formulas to generate the data that we don't have. So this could be um, extended amount, um, including tax. And it's a pretty simple formula. It's just the extended amount plus the, um, the tax amount. And so I can just write a formula. It looks very like Excel in here. I can go ahead and write that formula. And this is, looks pretty good. The number looks like it adds up. And now that I've got this extra column, I can just do that implicit measure and it brings it in and it's the correct answer. And the problem is that uh, when you write formulas like this, you're doing something which is fundamentally flawed in the world of Power BI. And that is that you are generating new data that is permanently stored inside your data model. And you want to avoid doing this wherever possible. When I was very early on in my DAX journey, I would say always avoid doing this. But over the years, I've learned more about the, the nuances of DAX and Power BI. And there are definitely some use cases where it makes sense to do a calculated column. So it's definitely not a case of never do this. But it is a case of never do it if there's a better alternative. And in this case, there is a better alternative. So if I come back to this column here and I've dragged, uh, sorry, back to this visual here and I've dragged this implicit column through, what if I tried to write um, this formula using a measure? So this is, would be uh, a naive or an incorrect approach. And so I could try and write this formula. Um, so this will be my uh, total sales, including tax, measure. And if I try and write that exact same formula, in fact, what I'm going to do, I'll just 
I'm going to hit equals one. This is a little trick that I use if I write the name of the measure and then I need to stop and go back and do something else. I normally just put equals one. What that does is it allows me to keep the name of my measure. It gives me an, um, a non-error returning measure, and I can come back and edit this in a sec. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to come and grab this exact formula that I wrote as a calculated column, control C, and I'm going to try and write this as a measure. And when I do that, I immediately get an error. And this is one of the fundamental differences between a calculated column and a measure. So I call this a naked column. So sales is the name of the table, extended amount is the name of the column. And you should think of this syntax as being like the fully qualified address. Because technically inside Power BI, I can have two columns with the name extended amount. I could have a column in my sales table. I could have another column in my customers table if I wanted to with exactly the same name, extended amount. This is perfectly legal in the DAX language. So it's just like um, I live on Short Street in Gladesville in Australia, and you could have a Short Street in Vancouver. That's perfectly valid. But once we add the table name at the front, we are uniquely identifying the column. So I would be Short Street Glazeville, you would be Short Street in Vancouver or wherever it is that you're living. And so the reason we put the table name at the front is to fully qualify the name of the column. And so notice though that there is no function, there is no function wrapped around these columns. And this is one of the fundamental differences between a calculated column and a measure is that inside a calculated column, you are allowed to refer to the column name. As long as the column is inside the table that you're writing, you are allowed to refer to the column name without wrapping it in a function. That is perfectly legal. But it is not valid inside a measure to refer to a column without wrapping it in a function. If you walk away with solid understanding of that, you will be better at DAX uh, already. So um, to make this work, what I could try and do is, is wrap this formula inside a sum function like this. But unfortunately, when I try and do that, it still gives me an error. And if I can try and trigger the IntelliSense here, I might struggle a little bit. The IntelliSense is not great in, in power. Um, in Power BI these days. But if I trigger the IntelliSense, you can see IntelliSense says the sum function adds all the numbers in a column. And it's implied that it's a single column. There's, you're not allowed to wrap more than one function inside a single column. And so I'm not allowed to do this behavior. But what I could do is write two different versions. I could write two functions. And so what I'm doing now is saying, add up all the values in the extended amount column. I'm not sure why this is. So this is the IntelliSense. This is now valid. I don't know why this is giving me an error. If I swap and go back, you'll see that the IntelliSense is now happy. And so this is one way that you could write a measure instead of a calculated column. And the way to do it is that because you're not allowed to refer to naked columns, you have to wrap each of those naked columns inside a single sum function. And then you've done, once you've done that, you can add those two sum functions together and it will give you the correct answer. And um, from a very simplistic perspective, that is an easy way to get started. But um, as, as I dig deeper, what I want to do is come in and show you um, how you can stop using a sum function and instead use a SUMX function. So I haven't really got into SUMX yet, but I do want to just pause there and see if there's any uh, questions or comments about those foundation concepts. So you got one okay. question, uh, um, Matt, from uh, Melinda. She says that you mentioned it's better to use, uh, sometimes better to use a calculated column versus a measure. When, what would one of those instances be? Very good question. So the general rules that I apply about calculated columns are, 
if you're putting it into a fact table, so a transactional table, generally try and avoid it if possible. It's less important if you put it inside a dimension table. I should have I should be in this row here. So these fact tables tend to be very large. So generally speaking, try to avoid it if you're putting the column in a large table is rule number one. Secondly, try to avoid it if it returns a large number of unique values. So if I jump back here to my extended amount column, if I look at this column here, notice that it's got 210 distinct values in this column. Um, so if this number of distinct values becomes very large, you should try and avoid a calculated column. And therefore it follows that it's generally okay to add columns into dimension tables because they tend to be smaller tables and also where the number of unique values is small so one or two values 10 values that's generally a good thing and then the third thing that I want to call out is that a measure cannot be used inside a slicer so remember this is a slicer if I tried to remove that column and tried to put a measure in here instead it doesn't work so, you know, if you're going to use the, the information as a slicer, it has to be a column. And so I'll give you a quick, a good quick example. If I wanted um, to know, let's say I'm on my slicer here and I want to filter my data by large customers and small customers. So, well, I, unfortunately, I don't have that information in my model, whether the customer is large or small. But what I could do is create a new column, a calculated column. So this is a good use case for a calculated column. And I'm going to call it large customers. And I can write a simple formula. There's a lot behind what's going on here, which I'm not going to go into. But I can write a simple formula that says the total sales are greater than or equal to 2,000. This is a true-false formula. For each customer, the total sales are either greater than 2,000 or they're not. And therefore, as a result of that, this column returns a true or a false. And now I've got a column that I can use in a slicer, or indeed I could use it in a matrix, to tell me, is this customer large or small? And it allows me to slice and dice my customers based on this information. So this would be a good example of where it makes perfect sense and is probably the best solution is to use a calculated column. Okay, good. very good. So let's let me. Uh, I'm going to continue on in this workbook now. I'm going to create another matrix. I don't know whether you've moved to the new UI in Power BI yet. I've deliberately move to this um, on object uh, interaction behavior. It's getting better, it was pretty rough to start with. It's still a bit rough, but I'm trying to get used to the new UI. So if you haven't seen it before, you can turn that on under preview. So I'm going to come in and um, I think I'll stick with subcategory because it's a nice long list. And this time I'm going to bring in my order quantity and now um, I thought actually I must have turned that on by mistake okay so here's my sum of order quantity and the, the point is what if I don't have this extended amount so if I come back to my sales table so I've got this extended amount column and this extended tax so I'm actually going to delete these columns just to, to force the conversation, I guess. So I'm deleting extended amount. I'm deleting extended tax. And just so I, um, I'll delete this column as well. But I've got a few errors up here because these measures are referring to columns that no longer exist. But let's take a look at the data now. So I've got for this first transaction, which here's the invoice number. This is the date of the transaction. This customer bought five items at $2,443 each. This is the tax per unit. This is the standard cost per unit. This is the price per unit. But nowhere does it tell me the total amount of the transaction. 
right? So this is this is a bit of a problem. So how do you solve this problem? Now, if I try to solve it the same way that I did with my last demo where I wrote that calculated column, I would come in here and do a new column. Remember, once I'm in a calculated column, I don't have to wrap it in a function. So I could generate this extended amount by just simply saying, take the quantity, um, what, what did I call order quantity, and this time, instead of adding, I'm multiplying it by the unit price. Once again, this is very Excel friendly. Everyone gets it. If you've ever converted an Excel spreadsheet to a table, you could add this column into your formatted table. You write a single formula, you get the right answer. It repeats its way all the way down the table. But as I've already covered, you want to avoid doing this because this is generally considered bad practice for the reasons I covered before. So I'm going to copy that calculated column. And instead, I'm going to write a new measure. I'm going to put it in my measures table. This will be the measures version. And as you already know, this is not valid syntax because I'm referring to naked columns, and that's illegal when you write a measure. But instead of writing, I can't actually do sum anymore, right? So what I did before was I did sum of the of the extended amount and I told it multiplied it by sum of the unit price. But logic tells you that this is not going to work in this case, right? So we can't do this. Um, so instead, I'm going to introduce you to the sum x function. And so instead of using the sum function. Uh, perhaps I'll delete this and we'll have a look at the syntax. I'm going to use the SUNX function. And the IntelliSense says, tell me the name of the table that you want to want this function to operate on, and then give me an expression. And so for reasons which I'll talk about in a moment, the table that I want to refer to is the sales table. Now, I am deliberately writing this function inside a table called measures. And the reason I'm doing this is that people often ask me, why do I have to specify the sales table? If I was writing this function inside, sorry, this measure inside the sales table, people often say to me, why do I have to say, why is the first parameter asking me for the name of the table? Because the measure is in the sales table. And so therefore, I've deliberately put this measure in a different table to highlight the point that the measure doesn't have to live in the same table as the calculation refers to. And therefore, the first parameter is you must specify which table the operation operates over. In this case, it's the sales table. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to write the exact same formula. So this here is exactly the same formula that I wrote over here when I did the extended amount. It's order quantity multiplied by the unit price. The only difference is that I, I have to use a SUMX function and I have to, have to specify the sales table. So if I write that as a formula, this is valid DAX. And if I come over here now and I bring my two versions of the formula, the extended amount column, and up to my measures table, the extended amount measure, you'll see that they return the identical result. Let me get rid of this one just for clarity. And I'm here to explain to you that in actual fact, my calculated column and my sum x function are doing the identical calculation. So in the case of the calculated column, Notice that I didn't specify a table name first. In fact, I haven't specified any function. What I have done, though, is I've added this formula, this let's call this the, the raw underlying formula. I've written that as a calculated column inside a table. Which table did I add the column? It was the sales table. So because I'm writing this calculated column in the sales table, I don't have to tell the DAX language, oh, this is all about the sales table because the column is in the sales table. So there's no need to reference the sales table, which is completely different to 
the fact that I've got the word sales here. So to illustrate the point, I don't have to put the word sales here. This formula will still work, right? I don't need – it's the, the reason this is working is not because I put the word sales in front of these columns. As I covered earlier on, putting the name sales in front of the columns is best practice because it clarifies two things. It clarifies the absolute reference to the column in case that same column name exists in more than one table. But the second thing is that it, it makes it easier to read because that's because when you write a formula like this, it's not clear is order quantity a measure or is it a column? And so it's best practice to always put the table name in front of the column name because it helps the DAX author understand that they're looking at a column and they're not looking at a measure, which becomes very important when you get deeper into the DAX language. And so there are two versions of this formula. This one is a calculated column. In the calculated column, I was not required to wrap any function. And um, I just put these two references to two naked columns. Both those naked columns exist inside the table and the formula just worked. And then in my second version of the exact same formula, I used exactly the same underlying base calculation, which says take the order quantity column, multiply it by the unit price column. But in this case, I had to specify the table because my measure could be in any table I like. In this case, it's in a table called measure. And I'm giving DAX the instructions to step through this table one row at a time and do the calculation. And that's exactly what this calculated column did. It stepped through the table, the sales table, one row at a time, and it did the calculation for every single row in this table. And so the learning that I want you to take away from this is that a SUMX formula is identical in behavior to a calculated column. The difference is that the SUMX formula has no requirement to permanently store each of the interim row by row calculations inside the model. When I store these extended amount and numbers in the table, it, it increases the size of the model. It will make it less performant. There's a whole lot of other issues with it as well. But fundamentally at a, um, at a grassroots level, what I'm introducing here is that a sum X function behaves exactly like a calculated column. Although if I could just extend that, remember when I dragged this um, my calculated column in, it automatically added them up. But remember, this is an implicit measure. I could right click and say, I want the average instead. So if I do the calculated column, drag it in, and then right click and say, give me the average, well, that would be the same as if I write a new measure, I'll just call this average measure. And so this will be the same as average X, step through the sales table, get my fingers in the right position. And this time, if I want to take the average, I'd do the same expression. It's the, the quantity column multiplied by the unit price column. But and let me just put it in so that you see it's the same result. So you can see here that the average here is the same as the average here. The core formula is the same. Take the quantity, multiply by the price. The only difference in this case is that I'm hard coding the behavior that I want, which is after you finish the calculation, give me the average. Whereas if I did it as a calculated column, I get to defer that decision right until the end after I drag that column in by selecting what type of implicit calculation that I want to do. All right, Ken, I might just take a breath, see if there's any questions. You're not going to take a long breath then, are you? Because you got a couple of questions. So um, okay. let's go uh, Let's go with Stanton's question first. Uh, he says, if I specify a, a measure that is sum X sales, and then, well, basically take the last measure that you wrote, and inside the actual multiplication section, strip off the fully qualified table names. If you just refer to the columns within that, it, will it work? It will work. It will, it will work. 
as long as so the short answer is yes, it will work. So you can see that. And in fact, um, now here's me being very bold. Jeffrey Wang, who works for Microsoft, he is the known as the father of the DAX language. He writes his DAX like this, and it drives me crazy. And he argues, well, you know, you know which column you're talking about because I'm inside an iterating function that refers to the table. So yes, it does work. I just think it's bad practice, and I recommend that you don't do it. And and in fact, if I come here to the customers table and do a new column, I probably this is probably let me make make a little make a little bit more sense. If I go to the products table and add a new column, I'm going to give it exactly the same name, unit price, no space. Right, it's just a, a make-believe column, but, but it physically exists in the model. If I come up here, um, this still works, right? So now this is an unqualified reference to a column which exists in two separate tables. This column exists in the sales table. It also exists in the products table, and this still works. But what if I was to say um, step through the products table? This is more advanced. Now I'm going to get an error. And, and I'll get an error for a couple of reasons. First of all, this column does not exist in the product table. So that's the first error. And then the second error is this unit price column is not throwing an error, but that's because it, it so let's put the sales back here. This second column is not throwing an error, but it's therefore implied that this column, even though I haven't changed the syntax, is now referring to the column in the products table, not the column in the sales table. And so I just think it's dangerous. And uh, But the answer to the question is yes, it will work, but I highly recommend that you don't do that. For reference, Stanton's walking back and saying, I don't do it, I'm just curious. <laughs> no, no, I, I know Stanton <laughs> well, so and, I'm, and I know <laughs> that he wouldn't do that. And I, I think it's a very good question because it, it gives you depth of understanding of what's happening under the hood and hopefully those little demos on how it behaves um, helps you understand what's going on. Absolutely. Uh, we got a couple more questions in here. Um, I'm going to, Sean, I will come back to yours. I'm going to leave that one for, for next, but uh, Melinda's asking, uh, can you use other measures with the X functions? Yes, definitely. Um, and so, in fact, I'll show you an example of that. So, but the, the anatomy of a sum X function if you look at the syntax, is it says take a table. So the way I want you to think about this now is that this is just like a calculated column. So if I could, the, one of the things about a calculated column is you can see, physically see what's going on, right? This is why calculated columns are easier to write than some X functions, because you can see what's going on. But if you, if you want to get your head around what's going on, go ahead and write the calculated column. And once you've got it working and you understand what's going on, then go and cut and copy the expression and bring it back and paste it inside a SUMX version of that calculated column. This would be one of the best pieces of advice I can give you to build your skill from not understanding how it works to getting to a stage where you do understand where it works. And then at some point in time, you can stop writing the calculated column because you just get it. But if you do it a few times that way, that will help. So this expression in the case of the examples I've done has been column plus column or column multiplied by column, but it could equally be column multiplied by measure or measure divided by measure. It could be whatever you want. It's a, a generic expression. So yeah. Cool. All right. Um, next question. Uh, this is a, a, a different uh, different angle on this one. Uh, the question is, do you like keeping your measures all together in one table? Um, I personally don't, but many people do. And there's no reason why you shouldn't. So um, generally I don't, but um, there's, it's good. I think it's common practice, put it that way. I'm surprised by that answer, Matt. Uh, honestly, um, I personally, I prefer not having all my measures in one table, but every demo I think I've seen you do, you always have it in one table. So I sort of thought was there was your preference. So No, it's definitely not. The only reason I did it in this case was because I wanted to demonstrate that 
the difference between that first table parameter inside of SUMAX and where the measure was actually living. I, I only threw that in at the last moment. There you go. Awesome. Uh, that's it for questions so far. Okay, so we've sort of built on this concept of a sum versus sum x. So what I'm going to do now, just let me check my notes, is I'm going to show you another example which just extends the concept of um, sum versus sum x somewhat. And so this case actually does use a measure inside my sum x, so probably pretty interesting fit for purpose. But let's let me show you the data first. So I've got a, a model here. I've got this is made up data. I've got sales transactions and they exist by stores. So I've got four stores. These stores were operating in business over two years. I think the data is 2014, 2015. Uh, so let's just jump across here. So here's my store. So I've got four separate stores and I've got all of these transactions over, uh, over two years. And the title of this topic is same stores. And so this is very common in retail where you're trying to understand how is the business performing? So this is just some raw um, data. Just let me yell at my dog for a second. Give me the bit Billy comes to work for me in the morning uh, in the office and you know, she's unhappy about something downstairs. Um, okay, so here's the raw data, and I've got uh, I've got some measure here in my table, Ken. So here's my total sales measure, and in this case, it's just sum of the extended amount, so that's working. And I've also got a total sales last year measure, and this is a little bit more advanced, but I'm just using an inbuilt time intelligence function that says, um, give me the same sales in the prior year. Now, if I was to look at that from a a year on year perspective, you can see that in the first year, there was a total of 8,300 sales. My sales last year is correct. In the second year, um, I've got $12,000 worth of sales. So on the face of it, you could say, well, wow, sales has increased nearly 50%. So this business is doing remarkably well year on year. What a fabulous business. But the problem with this calculation is it, it hides the fact that some stores weren't operating in 2014. So if I click on 2014, you can see that there was a few sales in uh, in that year, and then 2015, we get a lot more sales. Um, but let me actually show you a second visual, which illustrates the point. And so in this case, what I've done is I've put the months down, down here in a matrix. So this is the first month of 2014, the second month of 2014, and store one was operating in the first month of 2014, but this was its first year of operation because there's no sales for the previous year. But notice that store two was not operating in the first month of 2014. Store two didn't start trading until the fourth month and store three didn't start trading until the sixth month and so on. And, and so, the problem or the business problem that I'm trying to solve here is that I want to understand, is my business growing because I'm opening new stores or is my business growing because the stores that have been trading for more than 12 months are growing vertically? Are they getting vertical growth? So vertical growth is what we call same stores growth. Horizontal growth is what we call new store growth. And so this concept of same store calculations is a really good example of, of how we might need to use sum versus sum x. And I'll jump in and I'll just show you the, um, the sum x versions of these formulas, because basically what we're trying to do is we want to ignore any transactions that don't have a sales transaction in the previous year. That's the definition of same store growth is I'm only going to include the sales calculation for this year as long as they had a sales transaction in the previous year. And so what that might look like after a correct same store calculation has been put in place is that I'll only see these transactions where I have sales in both years. So notice that um, there's blanks here, and as soon as I get sales in the prior year, I start to get the data. Now, this formula is actually even more complex because 
if if I lay it out like this, it's very clear that yeah, okay, so this store did 265 in the first month, 254 same period last year. So I can just do the calculation. But in actual fact, this matrix has two dimensions. It's got stores along here. And it's got months down here. And I actually need to do the calculation for the intersection of every store for every month. Right. So this matrix that we're looking at is actually a two dimensional visualization of the logic of the calculation. And I actually need to do that calculation for the intersection of every store for every month. And the way I've done that using sum X is to do this. And so I've actually got two nested sum X functions. In fact, what I might just do is throw it into DAX formatter. So just jump here into DAX formatter, paste my function. This will give me some line numbers and a better layout, make it a little bit easier to uh, to explain. And so I'm going to start from the inside out here. And so let's just look at this part of the formula first. So you now understand the anatomy of a sum x function. Sum x steps through a table. In this case, it's stepping through the calendar table. And now notice that we're using measures inside these formulas, which was one of the earlier questions. And so what it's doing is it's going to the first row in the calendar table. And we've got an if statement that says, go and check to make sure that this store for this day has total sales greater than zero and also total sales last year greater than zero. Both of these conditions have to be true. And if both conditions are true, then go ahead and give me the total sales. And of course, the logic of line six will be to exclude any store that was open this year, but not open last year. And if you look at the other end of the, if you had a store that closed, it would make sure that it would exclude any store that had no sales this year, but did have sales last year. So this is a good calculation of same store sales. Now it, it is worth pointing out, and I, um, we're sort of getting towards the top of the hour. So I'm not sure how much more detail I'll get into. It is worth pointing out that this is a relative, considered a relatively inefficient formula. And that's because the calendar table over a two year period has got 700, 800 rows in it, between 700 and 800 rows in it. So I'm actually doing this calculation 700 times for every single store. And so it could be considered relatively inefficient there are more efficient ways of writing this formula. But in its simplest form, this is what the calculation is doing. But because I need to do this calculation for every single store, I then actually am wrapping the entire formula inside another SUMX formula. So the way this formula works is it goes to the first store, store one, and then totally focusing only on store one, it steps through every single row in the calendar table. It works out every single day that this particular store, store one, had a sale and it determines which numbers to keep and which ones to exclude. Then we go back and do the same thing for store two. And we go through the entire process again. And then the same thing for store three, and the same thing for store four. And at the end of that, we end up with the correct calculation. And so what I'm actually doing with this nested set of SUMX formulas is I'm effectively rebuilding this matrix visual so that I can check the intersection of, uh, sorry, the store and the month. In this case, I'm actually doing the day to work out whether I should do a calculation for this year or not. So this would be a more advanced use case. Sometimes you just have to do some X because, um, and, and when you do these formulas, often you'll get the correct answer in here, but you'll get the incorrect answer when you get to the total. And that's because the total 
effectively loses this concept of store by month calculation. When you get to the total rows in any of these matrix, what, what we're doing is we're ignoring the month by month calculation. We're ignoring the store by store calculation. And instead, we're using the aggregation of all stores and all months. And this is one of the reasons, if not the reason, why we have to generate these SUMX style versions of the formulas. All right, I'm going to just pause there again, Ken. All right, so um, Melinda's asking, how does it know to calculate by day, not month or any other time period? Very good question. The answer is this calendar table is a table and the SUMX function steps through the table one row at a time at the granularity of the table. And so if I go and have a look at the calendar table, the granularity of the table is the day level and therefore it's stepping through every row in the table one row at a time, which is at the day level. Now, to extend that a little bit more, in this case, my visual is looking at month by month calculations. And so in this case, let me, I, I can't do another version, but um, just remember perhaps this number 8412.10. So I could change this formula because uh, I'm not going to get a chance to go into a lot more depth. But instead of doing the calculation by stepping through the calendar table, uh, just let me get rid of this. Um, so instead of stepping through the calendar table, I could generate a new table. In this case, it'll be a virtual table that is much smaller. In fact, I might just spend a little bit more time on this now because I'm not going to get a chance to go. So let me, let's me let say instead of stepping through every day one at a time, I wanted to step through every month one month at a time because that would be more efficient. Instead of stepping through 730 different days, I'd only have to step through whatever this is, about um, a dozen or two dozen individual months. Now, the problem is I don't have a table of that granularity in my model, right? My table is at 730 rows. But what if I did have a table of that granularity? So I could, I could create one. So I'm going to create a new table. And I'm going to call this my month. months. I'll just call it months. I don't know if that's a reserved word or not. And I'm going to generate a table containing all the unique months. And so I can do that with values of the, I might do the um, year, year, month, month column, because that's the one that I'm using. Okay, so now I've generated a brand new table in my model. Let's go and have a look at it. Here it is. And it's, um, it's only got 24 unique rows. And now that I've generated this table, I'm going to make it part of my model. So I'm going to create a one-to-many relationship. All right, so now when, when I filter the months, that filters the calendar, which filters the sales. So this is great. So now I'm going to get rid of this. I'm currently using the calendar year, year, month, month. I'm going to stop using that. And instead, I'm going to use my new year, year, month, month from my new table. So the number is still the same, 8412. And now I can rewrite this formula. And instead of stepping through this table with 730 rows, I can say, no, use the table, which is the months table, with only 24 unique values. The number's not going to, oh, the number changed. I'll tell you why the number changed. And that is because um, I'm now using completed months to do my calculation. So it is technically possible that a store could have opened mid-month and that will change the way the calculation returns the result. But for illustration purposes, I'm trying to demonstrate that if we we're trying to do this calculation at a month level, we could actually do it by generating this new table. Right, now I'll, I just want to put the old um, table back in again for a sec. Because now I'm going to go and delete this table because I always want to avoid adding new data to my model. Now, this is going to throw an error, of course. Um, but what if I didn't have this table? Well, 
I can actually generate a virtual copy of this table on the fly. So instead of having to physically materialize that table, put it into my model, physically generate the relationship between the new table and my model, and then physically take the new column and put it into my visual, I can do all of that virtually. And so I can use values of the calendar year, month, month. And so now what I want you to understand and to uh, and to comprehend moving forward is that this is a virtual table. I could have physically generated that table that I wanted to, but that would create a whole lot of overhead that's not required. One of the beauties of the DAX language is that you can build these virtual tables on the fly inside your measure. You never have to materialize the table. And in fact, you get the one-to-many relationship for free. So when you generate a virtual table inside a measure, you also get the one-to-many relationship. And so this behaves as if it was physically inside the model. And when doing that, I still get the correct answer or a, a correct answer, and it's the 502. If I went back and had a look at these, um, the stores by month, you would be able to see that there would be some, some months that the stores open halfway during the month, and that's why it's giving a different calculation. But anyway, let me pause there and see, hopefully that answered that question and see if there's any more questions. You got to follow up on that one. Is the virtual table more efficient versus an actual table? Yeah, well, good question. Um, the answer is yes, assuming that the actual table doesn't already exist. So if you had a choice of materializing a physical table into your model or creating a virtual table, you're better off doing the virtual table as a rule because this is one measure, right? So imagine I've got 100 measures and they all need a virtual table. So what are you going to do? You're going to are you going to physically materialize a hundred different tables and create a hundred different relationships. So the answer is no. You're better off to use a virtual table, and uh, and pretty pretty much always in with this context, you're better off doing the virtual table. You get all the benefits um, without any of the overheads. Uh, all right. One other question. Um, this one goes a little back a little bit, just on the uh, the concept of SumX. Um, can you use columns from two different tables in your SumX? Yes, you can. Let me give you an example. Um, so, um, I might go back to my AdventureWorks example, just because I know the data a little bit. So let's say, um, how are we going for time, Ken? We're just we're probably right on one hour. Yeah, we're, people, we're flexible, people, though. I mean, people take are as much as you need, off. Right? Are, they, are, they, are they getting bored? Oh, they'll stick around for as much as you will give them, Matt. All right. So maybe I'll, maybe I'll just – what I'll do is I'll jump to my third demo. Just let me try and find it. Where have I uh, – I've lost my – Just to follow up on that, Melinda says there's no way she's getting bored, so keep going. Okay, good. Yeah, you know, I, I've actually I learned a lot from Chris Webb. Completely different topics, but I've, I don't know if you've ever seen Chris Webb talk, but he, he's a he's a wonderful presenter. And Chris spends a lot of time on the detail. You know, he I think he tends to focus on um, less is more, and just spending time without trying to cover 12 different things, just try and do one or two things really well. And I really like the way he presents. And, and I sort of, in recent years, have tried to bring those concepts into my presentation. So instead of trying to do broad coverage of everything, just try and do uh, less at a deeper level of understanding. So, um, so yeah, so hopefully that's, that's coming across here. And um, all right, so I've got a new data model here. So I think, I think this, answers that question. So this is very simple data. So I've got a product table and a sales table. So my sales table on a given date, we have four different products, A, B, C, D. This is the quantity and this is the price. All right, so very similar. You know now that I could quickly write a calculated column in here. You know why you shouldn't do that. And you also know that you could do a sum X to give the same result. 
Um, just let me quickly show you the product table. So we've got the product and the unit price. So there's the four products. All right, so I'll give you a quick example. So this is just a setup. There's the product. That's the sum of, the, this is the sum of the quantity I've just taken. I'm assuming this is just uh, sum of this quantity. The price is just taking the state price. And so, of course, I could write a sum X. And this would be, um, okay, so total sales. So hopefully you know what to do now. I'm going to sum X through the sales table. And I'm going to take the price that exists in the sales table and multiply it by the quantity that exists in the sales table. So this is exactly the same as what we've already been doing. It gives the correct answer. Um, and so so all, all good there. All right, but what if I wanted to refer to a column in a different table, which is what this question is. Now, if you look at the data, I've got the price here in the sales table, but note that I've also got the price in the product table. So what if we could find a way to use the column in the product table rather than the column in the sales table? Because if we did that, we could get rid of the column in the sales table. And trust me, that would be good for the overall efficiency of the model. And so I could write a second version of this formula. So I'll call this total sales using unit price and product table. And so I would go sum X over the sales table, step through the sales table one row at a time, grab the quantity, not the quotient, the quantity, and multiply it by the product. Now notice the IntelliSense is not helping me. I want the product unit price, but IntelliSense is not helping me. And so you might recall from earlier on that when I wrote my syntax, it only allowed me to refer to columns that exist in this table. And that's why the IntelliSense is not working. But there's a function called related. And now I can reference the unit price in the product table. So let's just quickly check that it gives us the same answer, which it does. And you can think of related as VLOOKUP. So in this use case, related is behaving just like VLOOKUP. It's saying, for this particular row in my sales table, do a VLOOKUP against the product table, go and grab the single price from the product table, bring it back, and give me the correct answer. And that's basically this. So, so this is a use case where I'm actually referring to a column in a different table so but we can build on this because there's a gen there's a couple of general rules inside um to be used when doing some so one rule is never step through a big table so when i say step through never use a sum x with the first table parameter being a big table if instead you can use a small table and, and so there's another way I could write this formula, and that is to write the formula as a stepping through the products table. Now, I think what I'll do in this case is I might just come up and show you here, because this, this is definitely more complex. This is the most complex I'm going to get in this presentation, um, because I'm now going to introduce the concept of evaluation context and context transition which is definitely the hardest thing to learn about the DAX language. So, so here's the product table. We've got a one-to-many relationship to the sales table. If I come over to the product table and I add a new column, and I say this will be the total sales quantity, what I want to know for this product table, what is the total sales quantity? Now, if I write sum of the sales quantity, now some of you, I know some of you have already done this and you know what's going to happen here. Um, Stanton has been to many of my classes. I know he knows this. I'm sure there are others that know the answer. But what do you expect to happen when I write this formula as a cathode column? 
inside my product table? Well, I think most people would expect to see total sales for product A, total sales for product B, total sales for product D, but that's not what happens when you write this formula. When you write this formula, you get the total sales for the total of all products inside the database. So this is complex, but um, this is the way it works. If I want to get the total sales for each product, I have to use a calculate. So I'm going to wrap my formula inside a calculate, and now I get the behavior that I expect. And so now I've written a calculated column in my products table, and in order to get the total sales for the individual product, in this case, product A, B, C, D, I have to say calculate sum of the sales quantity. Okay, so now with that background in place, and as I said to you earlier on, if you want to learn how to use sum X, then start by writing a calculated column. And once you've written a calculated column, then jump over to a sum X function. And so I could now multiply this by the unit price, and this would be total sales value now. And this is the correct answer. So if I come over here and bring this total sales value, I'm not getting a number here at the total column, which um, there's, there's a good reason for that, which I may get time to come back to. But notice, at least at the row by row, I'm getting the same answers, right? Rounded off to the nearest number. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this formula, this calculated column, as a measure. So I'm going to come here, I'll put it in the sales table, a new measure. So total sales value via product table measure. So I need to, because I'm now no longer doing a calculated column, I need to do a sum X. This time I'm stepping through the products table one row at a time and doing the calculation here. And if I bring this in here, um, my IntelliSense is getting in the way a little bit here. And so now you can see that I'm, I'm getting the correct answer. This time, um, there's a difference at the grand total level, um, yeah, which is a little bit more complex, but uh, you can see that that's working. And so um, this was the question that came was a good lead in um, to, to this particular answer. And so I'm using, I'm referring to a column. In fact, in this case, I'm stepping through the product table. It's a smaller table than the sales table. It's only got four rows. I'm stepping through that table one row at a time. For each row, there is already a single value for the unit price. I'm taking that single value and I'm multiplying it by the sum of the sales quantity for that one product. We saw that calculation earlier on in the calculated column, and this is giving me um, the correct answer. This is still not the most efficient way I could write this formula, but it's close to the most efficient way I could write this formula. So hopefully that answered that question, and I'll jump back and see if there's any more for me. I have questions. I think we're good at this point. Uh, the only sort of comment was context transition always makes my brain hurt. Yeah, and I, and <laughs> I understand that. And yeah, me too. Um, yeah, it's the thing about context transition is that you need practice and experience in DAX before that concept can attach to your experiences so that you understand it. And my advice to people is, if you don't understand it, don't worry about it. I think the stages of mastering context transition are stage zero, you don't know what it is, you don't know it exists. And then stage one would be, you know it exists, but you don't understand how it works. Um, Stage three would be, you know it exists, you don't really understand how it works, but you know what to do to make it work. 
And in this case, that would be to wrap a calculate function around this. And then stage four is then you understand why it behaves the way it does and you know what to do. I still write incorrect formulas due to context transition issues, but I do understand how it works. When I write a formula, I know the signs that it's probably a context transition issue. I know how to look at the formula and identify where I need to add my calculate functions. And normally when I go ahead and add them, it basically fixes the problem. So that's the stage of the journey that most people go on. And I would suggest don't try and formally learn those journeys. Instead, try and use applied learning. So practically go on that learning journey by actually taking and writing your formulas. When you get an example, use your knowledge of the fact that context transition is a thing. And maybe this is a good example of that thing and and therefore use it. So I think the last thing I'll do, Ken, I'm just going to show uh, one more formula. I did mention this is still not the, the most efficient version of this formula. There's one more that's even more efficient, at least um, conceptually. And so let's come back to the model. So remember I said um, we talked earlier on about stepping through the calendar table versus stepping through the month table. If I have a look at this products table here, Notice that the price column, uh, that's the wrong table. Notice that the unit price column has only got two distinct values. So the price is either $4.70 or it's $5.50. And using, excuse me, using the general rule that says always step through the smallest table you can, it would actually be more efficient if I could create another table here containing the two unique prices. So this table would have two rows, 550 or 470. I could join that new table to my table and I could write a formula stepping through two different tables, sorry, two different rows of the unit price table. But of course, as I've already covered, we want to avoid materializing these tables if we can. And indeed we can because we can create virtual tables. And so the way we would write this formula would be instead of stepping through the physical table, which is this one, we would instead use on values of the product unit price. And in this case, a new virtual table containing the two unique prices gets generated in the engine. This part still works. Context transition still works. But now instead of doing the the total sum of the sales per product, it's doing the total sum of the sales by price, which is there's only half as many calculations now as there were before. And we're still able to refer to the unit price because that unit price is being referenced inside this here. And so this will give the same answer as before, at least conceptually it's more efficient because we've got, um, we're stepping through, we're iterating through a smaller table and that's generally considered to be um, uh, more efficient. Okay, one last thing and then my slides, sorry, I forgot, there's one more thing I need to show you. Um, and that is the concept of um, syntax sugar. So my first, um, I got rid of this extended amount column earlier on, which is uh, a little bit of a problem. So I'll just quickly write a new measure. So if I do total quantity is equal to sum of the quantity column. So this is, we're back to the bog standard aggregation function now, total quantity. This is my total quantity measure. And what I'm about to tell you is that I could write this formula as follows. And that would be sum x through the sales table, give me the quantity. Notice that the expression in this case is just referring to a single column. It's the same anatomy that we've been, I've been talking about throughout the entire session. We're stepping through the sales table one row at a time, but for each row, just give me the single value that exists inside the order quantity column. 
Notice that I get the same answer. And in fact, what I'm about to tell you is that these two formulas are identical. They are identical in operation. In fact, they are the same formula. And in fact, the sum function technically doesn't even exist inside the DAX language. We call this syntax sugar. This is a simplified way of writing this formula. It was put in place by the developers to make it easier for people moving from Excel into Power BI because people are familiar with the concept of sum. If I said to an Excel user when they're first starting out that if you want to add a column, you have to do sum X, you have to specify the name of the table, then refer to the column, that would just be a step too much for the average beginner. And therefore, this concept of syntax sugar has been introduced to make that journey a little bit easier for everyone. All right, so I've got two slides and then I'm going to jump back to any other questions. So I'm not sure why this is so slow. I don't know if I've thrown up. Oh, here we go. It's very slow. Okay, so here's the concept of syntax sugar. So they're actually, so this is the concept of sum versus sum X. So you would use sum X when you need to do a, a multi column calculation on the fly. And um, and so other use cases for sum X is when your totals don't add up, when you want to simulate the existence of rows on a visual, which is what we did with the uh, same sort of calculation. Um, and generally, it's better to load the quantity and price rather than the extended amount column, which is also something which is not immediately intuitive. And I've got a, a link here to an article which I wrote some versus some 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 time ago. Okay, that's pretty much the content that I had in mind. Uh, but yeah, happy to take any more questions. I don't see any questions in the queue right now, but um, while we uh, wait for uh, for others to uh, to drop one in there, um, I'm going to ask you one because I've actually got this question from uh, from people that come to my classes before. Um, is uh, is there any efficiency difference between sum versus using sum x to basically just go and iterate over the exact same table? No, it's identical. All right. And in fact, if I if I fired up um, the uh, so you, up, you can come up and view the performance analyzer. And one of the things you can do in a performance analyzer is you can, if I refresh these visuals, and so here's the, so I'm not sure which matrix, uh, this is a table, probably this one. You can actually have a look at the query. And uh, so I can have a look at the query. The only way to answer some of these questions is to actually look at the underlying query. And so, yeah, you can actually see if I take this into DAX formatter that exactly the same operation is sent to the underlying database. And so um, the DAX language has what's called a, um, a, well, sorry, Power BI has what's called a DAX parser, P-R-S-E-R. -E and this is, so the first thing it does is it takes your code and it converts it into the underlying language that the data model needs to be able to do the calculation. And if it sees the sum function, it just swaps out sum with sum X, and therefore it's identical. There you go. Fair enough. Uh, one question in the chat. Will the slides be available? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll send them to you, Ken. All right, no worries. put them up make... somewhere. Yeah, you bet. We'll, uh, we'll post a, a link to that on the Meetup site. Um, and I don't see any other questions coming in at all. All right, well, so, hopefully that's that it's either everyone's baffled or um, <laughs> or maybe can't take any more or um, um, yeah. So I, ho I hope okay. So a few comments there. Thanks very much for for the feedback and a few people putting up some comments. Um, yeah, as I said, I my objective really was to to not try and cover everything. Just you know, spend some time. Hopefully, there's some takeaways there for for everyone. Better understanding. Build on it, build on this, right? So see where you go. 
Absolutely. Well, listen, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks a ton for coming and doing this, Matt. Um, it's been uh, been too long since we've actually had you uh, present to the uh, to the user group here. So it's uh, great to uh, to have you back and see you. Um, just for reference to uh, just uh, make sure uh, this is known again. Um, so uh, Joseph will be doing the what's new in Power BI for the next month's uh, presentation. We're going to hold off on uh, on that stuff uh, here. So he's got at least one month to talk about uh, next month, depending on whether or not they give a release in time. And uh, oh, and May. So he's got at least two months to talk about. There you go, because that one didn't actually drop in time. I think you're right. Um, so yeah, there'll be lots of uh, lots of what's new to talk about uh, next month around. Um, on that note, uh, we will sign off for uh, for today. Um, I will get the uh, recording up in the next 24 to 48 hours. We'll post on the Meetup site if anybody wants to go back and review it. Uh, it will be hosted on the Skillwave YouTube channel. And um, yeah, we'll uh, we'll sign off for today. So thanks again, bud. Really appreciate it. We'll catch you. Thanks, all next everyone. Time. Thanks for joining.